Jason, yeah. welcome to the show. Meb, glad to be back. It's been three, maybe four years since the last time we had you on. Listeners, we'll, we'll link to it in the show notes. I think last time you were in Taipei. Does that ring a bell? That's right. That is correct. I was actually uh, speaking from my apartment in Taipei. Where, uh, where have we found you over the last few years and where are you now? Well, uh, I'm usually either in the States or somewhere in Asia, but right now at this moment in time, I'm in Irvine. Right down the road. Well, hopefully we're not too far away from doing this in person. I miss those. Um, maybe, according to the government, a couple months away. We'll see. Um, what's been going on? Last time we talked, you were just starting your new company, Raliant. Uh, walk us through the last couple of years. What's been going on in markets? What's been going on with you? Catch us up. All right. Well, last few years, uh, we've been building our presence in Asia, specifically onshore to China. Uh, launched a number of ETFs in China and in Hong Kong. Uh, gathered about uh, $2 billion across five different ETFs. Uh, learned a lot uh, about what it's like doing business in China. Learned a lot about that market and realized uh, it is not just you know the U.S., uh, maybe a few decades behind, but it is quite idiosyncratic, very, very unique. Uh, the culture, the language all makes what we come to understand as markets quite different in, in, in China. But it's been a lot of fun, a lot of learning, uh, and uh, you know the team's loving it. Uh, we're now you know, taking all of that and bringing it back to the U.S. Uh, so that's what we've been busy doing the last few months is... Uh, to bring our China products uh, to the U.S. and then we'll be launching a uh, number of products over uh, over the next few uh, few years. It's exciting! Congrats, and we'll we'll get to the one that you launched here a couple months ago. Uh, you mentioned a note. I would love to hear you expand on a little bit. What what would be the differences that you know? I've I've actually never been to China. I've been to Hong Kong, uh, pre turnover. Uh, what would be some of those? Differences that would surprise me or others, or ones that you found in the business world to be uh, uh, a little different than perhaps uh, over here. Well, first and foremost, uh, when we think about you know Chinese policymakers and regulators, we tend to have a fairly negative uh, perspective, and you, we we look at it more from a you know a communist party and authoritarian party versus the US, which is, you know, democracy based. Uh, and that's really not the right lens. What I have found is you really want to think of Chinese regulators versus US regulators as kind of the tiger mom versus uh, Montessori, uh, perhaps. It's very paternalistic in China. So when you talk to regulators, they're always thinking about, well, what is for the greater good and how to regulate and bring about that? Uh, and there's very little trust in the market leading to the greater greater good. Uh, and so, for example, you think about you know, the US stock exchange, right? It's very much a buyer be aware, you know, consenting adults making trades so no one gets to complain. But the exchange in, the, in, in China, uh, they feel like it's their responsibility to only list good companies. Uh, and so in the listing process, they actually come in almost as an independent underwriter and conduct independent due diligence. So it's actually much more difficult to get listed in China because the exchange uh, is, is just terrified of listing a firm that uh, would eventually um, you know, blow up or, or drop a lot in stock price. Uh, and then in addition to that, once you get listed, the exchange will constantly uh, launch investigations uh, if they you know, discover that uh, your, your accounting doesn't make sense, what your CEO is saying doesn't line up with what you're filing with the tax authority, doesn't line up with what you're filing with the exchanges. So it's almost like an army of, you know, sell side analysts working at the exchange, trying to dig up dirt uh, and, and finding out what firms are, are behaving well or behaving badly. So that's a, you know, that's, that's probably one of the biggest difference uh, differences that I see between uh, US and China regulators and that sort of cascade into almost every aspect of doing business uh, and managing money in China. What's been going on in the Chinese markets the last few years uh, since we last talked? Uh, any, um, any general comments? And of course, there was a little pandemic in, in between. Um, what's, uh, what's the updates? Well, if, if you think uh, value uh, has been taking in the chin in the U.S. Uh, let me just tell you, last year, 
uh, growth in China outperformed value by 35%, right? I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you think you can earn a value premium of one to 2% a year, right? Basically last year in China, you just lost about 15 years worth of value premium that one could, could, could you know, gather and earn. Uh, and so that's, that's a market that is just volatile. Uh, you know, the, you can call it a bubble, you can call it irrationality, can certainly run wild uh, and deviation can be larger and longer than you have, uh, you know, capital to, to hold still. Uh, so the last few years, it's been certainly a very growth oriented, um, frothy bubble market in China, uh, more so than even uh, in the U.S. And uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, you know, the market reaction around that event in China was very muted, right? In the U.S., you saw an initial decline, you know, down as far as 30%. Uh, followed by kind of gradual climb before making new highs. In China, it was a tiny blip downward and immediately uh, the market's making new high. And it speaks to the, I think, the increasing uh, lack of correlation decoupling between Chinese uh, capital markets from, from certainly U.S. capital markets, if not from the global capital markets. Uh, and in some ways, that, that's a good thing, right? Because I think as investors, we're always looking for uncorrelated sources of return. And we're, we're almost running out of them as, as the world has become so correlated. I know this is basic stuff, but give us the quick overview uh, again for the listeners who may not be as familiar when they hear about China. You know, they hear about, well, they're included in some indexes. They're not included in some. There's some A shares. There's some H shares. There's things listed. G give us the quick summary of the way it works. And if I recall... Last time we chatted, you were saying it tends also to be a lot more uh, on the volume side, a, a retail driven market as well. Is that still true? Give us just kind of the quick overview of what uh, of how the, the Chinese market is different than, say, uh, what we think of when we think of the U.S. Absolutely. Uh, so when people talk about, you know, uh, Chinese equities. Uh, there are you know, onshore versus offshore, which is certainly something you don't see in the U.S., right? So onshore are referred to as the A shares. These are you know, shares that are traded on either the, uh, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange or the uh, Shanghai Stock Exchange. And then you have the offshore shares. Uh, these are things that are traded in Hong Kong uh, or traded primarily, say, U.S. as ADRs. And the firms that trade uh, onshore versus offshore are often quite different. Uh, so take, for example, you know, most of us are probably more familiar with many of the ADR. So take Alibaba uh, and also take many of the Chinese firms that sort of blown up and gotten China a, a black guy and bad reputation and has led to sort of uh, the U.S. imposing the Hold Foreign Company Accountable Act, you know, really targeting uh, Chinese firms that, that seem to have suspect uh, disclosure practices. Uh, and that's actually much more offshore and much more US ADR. Whereas if you then look at say the Hong Kong listed shares, they're generally state-owned enterprises. Right? So they're like the biggest banks that on the first day of listing is already at $400 billion in size. They're the biggest telcos. Um, and the reason is you know, Hong Kong has always been the gateway to China and viewed by the Chinese government as the face of the country. Uh, so they've only approved just the biggest, most stable, most intimidating you know, uh, enterprises to be listed there. And then you're not surprised these are, you know, often big giant state monopolies with strong cash flow and then unlikely to grow very much, but certainly unlikely to have any kind of risk event. And then that leaves you with all the onshore, which is where really all the interesting actions are, right? A lot more firms, a lot uh, greater, uh, you know, uh, sector uh, exposures that you can get access to. Uh, you know, much more significantly uh, uh, sort of non-state-owned, so, you know, private enterprises. But what's more interesting is onshore is almost entirely retail traded. So it's 85, 90% retail traded, whereas the Hong Kong and the US ADR, if you're not surprised, uh, they're going to be overwhelmingly uh, institutionally held and institutionally traded. And so in terms of alpha opportunities, uh, you imagine the onshore A shares would be more alpha rich, right? Because you have participants who are just not as sophisticated. And so as far as the complexity, um, give us an overview. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people, rightly so, would make the assumption that the Chinese stock market will 
probably eventually become the world's largest. You know, it's not currently. The U.S. is, I think, half or a little over half. Give us an overview of, of what it looks like, any differences, whether it's sector composition, um, do most investors uh, in China and here currently simply uh, um, allocate through market cap weighting, indices? Uh, how do most people go about it uh, today? In China uh, today, there are you know, roughly 3,800 liquidly traded stocks that are included in kind of the key you know, indexes you know, covering large to the small caps. Now you compare that to US, right? US has been shrinking, right? US used to be, you know, closer to 5,000 and it's uh, really closer to 3,200 today. So while US is sort of shrinking down the public markets as many things have gone more private and most of the money have sort of concentrated toward the top end of the index, now China is sort of doing the opposite, right? There's more stocks being listed and it's quite very, very liquid down even on a small cap range. Uh, and so, so you, you, you now have more stocks liquidly traded in, in China and certainly the trading volume is close to the US. So that would be kind of a, a little bit of where China is, is sort of catching up to the US. But in terms of capitalization, you're right. It's only half of what US is today. Now the projection is it will likely uh, overtake over the next 10 years, because, you know, more wow, of these, within the 2020s. Yeah, because more of these uh, unicorns, right, are coming online, whereas most of the U.S. companies have, have, you know, kind of largely gone gone listed. But there are a lot of these mega unicorns in China that are just seeking for the seeking the right opportunity to, to be listed. Uh, and so, so, you know, uh, certainly with uh, price appreciation and more firms listing, uh, and and obviously with the GDP potentially overtaking the U.S. over the next, uh, say five to ten years, um, the capital market overtaking the U.S. is a is a is a, a significant reality. And in terms of investors in that market, though, uh, the concept of indexing or a benchmark, uh, or even thinking about you know cap weighting is very foreign. Um, mm-hmm. Most investors just aren't there yet, uh, so there are very few benchmarks products in, in, in China. Uh, and certainly the whole idea, you need to uh, benchmark your manager, you want to outperform the index. Um, that's a, you know, that's a foreign concept that not many, even in, even some in the institutional world don't quite hold it. So, so I, I was laughing as you were talking about the number of companies, because in my head, I'm like, well, if Silicon Valley keeps launching a, a thousand SPACs a day here in the U.S., we'll eventually catch up because there'll be no more private businesses with, with the amount of SPACs going on. Um, and so how do like, it, you know, so are most people, is it like kind of like old school stock picking, you know, where they're just amassing a portfolio of, of stocks based on whatever their approach may be? Yeah, so um, the funds industry is, is actually tiny relative to, uh, the kind of wealth that sit with the uh, discount uh, brokers inside China. So it's very much like the 70s, maybe early 80s in the, in, the, in the U.S. where, you know, the brokers are dominant in terms of, you know, wealth management, let's call it for lack of a better word. Uh, yeah, so individuals primarily uh, trading aggressively, uh, often day traders. I mean, they, they probably hold anywhere from four, to six stocks and uh, turn it over a couple hundred percent a month. <laughs> so that, that describes your average uh, retail individuals. It's, it's not really saving for retirement. It's, it's more social gambling right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all of the lead-in seems to make the case. Uh, I think um, there's a lot of opportunity uh, to be investing in China. Um, talk to us a little bit about your new fund. Uh, you put out a new fund here and, and feel free to weave in any of the ones you're, you're managing um, abroad, but would particularly like to hear what, uh, what you guys, the methodology behind uh, your new strategy launched just a few months ago. Yeah, so you know, at the kind of highest investment philosophy level, this is very much about uh, giving you exposure to a interesting uh, uncorrelated beta that currently doesn't live in a lot of investors' portfolios. Uh, and then, of course, tapping into that massive uh, alpha reservoir provided by really these uh, uh, unsophisticated gamblers who come to the market uh, really for social gambling than for long-term investing. So the beta is interesting. And if you tag on the alpha opportunity, uh, we think there, there's a, you know sort of a real opportunity for managers and also 
uh, global investors. Uh, so what we brought out in the U.S. is a uh, an active ETF, and uh, so basically it's not tracking an index. It really is just our uh, you know multi-factor, quantitatively driven uh, China Asia's active strategy, uh, just in a uh, ETF chassis. And today, you know, with how uh, slick you know the whole ETF uh, each, uh, ecosystem is. Uh, it's, it's cost effective. It's very easy. It, it, it's, um, kind of, uh, it dominates a, a mutual funds, a chassis. So we thought, you know, why not bring it out in an, in an ETF format, uh, and then still be able to, to be fully active. Uh, now in terms of, uh, you know, what drives the, uh, the, the alpha profile for the fund, uh, you know, a lot of it's just really targeting, what are the persistent behavioral biases that you can identify in in China? So some some of it will be fairly familiar to, to you. Uh, it will be similar to many of the things that that maybe you have in your uh, own strategies. Uh, so I, I would call it you know anti growth works really well in in China, uh, and it's because you know in China it's one glitzy shiny theme after another and they never pan out well. So if you just systematically avoid things of trading at you know, 500 times uh, uh, earnings, uh, you're, you're generally going to, to do well and participate in the true growth of, of the Chinese economy. Uh, you know, a lot of it is avoid what the retails are buying uh, and, uh, and instead you know, participate in what the, you know, more educated, more informed uh, long-term buy and hold institutions are doing in China. So avoiding, you know, sh shares that are, are heavily held uh, by retail you're going to do well. You're going to participate in the China growth a lot better. Uh, and what, what is what is the retail attracted to? Is it just kind of the obvious momentum names of what's doing well? Is it like the big tech companies? Yeah, so retail is often attracted to what's done well recently. So there is a unbelievable uh, return chasing that's amplified by the entire ecosystem. Uh, so if you, if you have a brokerage account, right, the broker is constantly texting you, your phone's constantly, you know, ringing or reminding you, you know, what's, uh, you know, the highest advancer uh, today, uh, what's, uh, what's the best performing stock sector. Uh, and of course, mutual fund companies in, in China, uh, different than the US, um, there's not a lot of sort of core offerings. Most offerings are very thematic, very sector oriented. So the best performing sectors would have, you know, lots of new uh, funds and ETFs being launched around that, uh, all which just amplify uh, return chasing. Uh, so it's very much a short-term momentum market, uh, thematic market, uh, growth-oriented market for uh, retail trading. And of course, those don't uh, produce long-term results, right? So if you, if you look at the retail underperformance versus the market, like I think in the U.S., it's, it's you know, something like you know, 4 or 5%. Um, in China, it's closer to like 12, maybe 14%. Uh, of sort of the retail performance versus say a buy and hold of the market. Wow, that's that's significant. I was I was smiling as you were talking as I was looking over your fact sheet because as you talk about some of these quantum uh, approaches, you know, you have the traditional value, quality, um, and then a, a couple columns for for management team integrity, which I don't know if I've seen on a on a on a traditional U.S. based quant ranking. And then a smart versus dumb money score, and then a safety score. Um, talk about how they how they play in. I feel like most of the listeners would be familiar with traditional value composite sort of ideas, quality. What are some of these other uh, you know metrics or, or ways to think about name inclusions into the into the portfolio? Uh, absolutely. So uh, the integrity of the business operator is is huge. Uh, People are not crazy to suspect that uh, Chinese accounting numbers uh, may not be as trustworthy and reliable. So if you're going to build a model, uh, you know, DCF or otherwise, using those numbers, you probably uh, are going to come up with numbers that just aren't very useful. That suspicion is not crazy. It is absolutely true. So we, we did a study where we basically looked at, uh, you know, the reported accounting numbers. And the, you can clearly see that, uh, you know, Chinese companies 
uh, really try very, very hard not to report a negative number, right? It just doesn't look like a normal distribution. Like firms seem to never lose money, which is quite abnormal. And we know that's for first sign of, of some kind of aggressive earnings smoothing or earnings manipulation. Uh, so in fact, we, we find overwhelming evidence supporting that fear. But if you look even deeper, what's interesting is the you know, substantial majority of firms that manipulate earnings actually manipulate them downward, not upward. That's truly bizarre, right? If you're gonna fudge accounting, you wanna fudge it upward so you get a higher stock price so you can uh, pump and dump, right? But no, in China, it actually works the opposite. And again, this goes back to what I mentioned earlier on in the show about paternalistic regulation. Because in China, if you lose money as a company, the exchange come and kind of slap you around a little bit. If you lose money again, right? Um, now there are restriction placed on the trading of your stock. Your stock can't be margined. If you lose money again, they begin to prepare you for delisting. So firms are terrified of that. So uh, they, they try to not avoid, uh, not, not to report a loss. What they do is when they are very profitable, they underreport profits. So they pocket a reserve. So when they have a bad year, they can use the reserve um, to smooth earnings. And if they have a bad year where they have to report a negative number, they'll just report an enormously large one way more than the amount of money they actually lost, again, to build a reserve uh, so that uh, they, they would avoid two consecutive negative years. Um, and so once you recognize that and know how to restore the actual income statement and balance sheet, you can just model a lot better. Uh, and so when I say integrity of management, you can basically figure out, is the management fudging accounting, trying to pump and dump, in which case very low integrity and there are lots of other issues, or are they just trying to comply with a, a perhaps a, you know, somewhat naive set of regulations and, and really are, are being quite conservative as business operators. What's the, uh, what's the safety sort of metric come into play? Is that similar to quality? Is it sort of a balance sheet issue? Is it more of a sector things you avoid? Uh, what's, uh, what's the insight there? Yeah, so when we look at a variety of sort of safety in indicators, uh, a lot of it is leverage. Uh, in China, you have two types of growth firms. Uh, one grows because look, they're they're literally you know coming up with a good idea and selling it to 1.6 billion consumers, right? That's wonderful growth when you when you can sort of you know scale that up. But there are a lot of old, uh, uninteresting, uh, you know, manufacturing with no brand, uh, no no market share, who's growing just because they're leveraging, they're just applying leverage. Uh, and so you end up finding a lot of growth firms that, oddly enough, are heavily leveraged, right? something you never see in the U.S. And then that would be, say, a, a very major uh, uh, sort of uh, risk flag. Uh, you know, other uh, sort of safety indicators uh, would be just related to the skewness of their return distribution, uh, related to how highly correlated, how high beta they are uh, with, uh, with, you know, the broad market. There's um, you have a good paper out called uh, you you've long written uh, great research, and prolific too. And there's one um, recently that came out a few months ago called "Should Investors Allocate More to China A Shares?" Putting comment arguments to the test that I thought was uh, a really good paper, and um, you know, kind of along the same lines of this manipulation, um, sort of uh, you know. Um, quality metrics, management integrity. You mentioned on the banking side, you know, you got to always read the footnotes and cleaning the data. That's something that, um, you know, I think people think about here, but not as much. Maybe, um, uh, you know, the, the footnoted blog and, and, and forensic accounting, but, but not as much. Well, what's the experience been like in China? Is that something that's like, a necessity uh, that is pretty widespread. You see some crazy stuff. Uh, is it something you can just clean with a quant database? How does that work out? Yeah, so you, you I mean, building databases in, in China is both interesting, uh, frustrating, but, but also you know, super exciting. Because first of all, there's just lots and lots of data, right? Like in the US, uh, oftentimes you don't have data because you know, we didn't used to keep track of that much stuff. And it was much more expensive back then. Uh, but you know, China really began as a as a as a liquid capital market 
15 years ago. And so everything was modern uh, and lots of data sort of kept, but it's very clean, it's very easy to access. So it's, it's, there's just a lot of data. And second of all is, uh, you know, you're, you're probably not surprised. China just loves collecting data. Anything and everything that can be collected is collected and gathered. And they're not too, you know, strict about data privacy. So uh, a lot of that is actually made available for, for research, for studying, uh, for purchase, for web, web scraping. So you can make, build lots and lots of uh, interesting data. And it really comes down to, can you make sense of it? Uh, can you create value out of it? Can you analyze it? There's a quant. It's, it's, it's just a you know, wonderful uh, laboratory, right? It's just a great place to study data and then you know, make that data useful. And it's like the second part that's exciting. Uh, the US has a lot of data as well, probably not as much as China, but there's still you know, lots of data and it's longer data, right? But the bad news there is there are too many quants in the US. So we studied all the same data to death, right? And we're just competing against each other at, 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 to the degree that there's almost very little uh, alpha that can be squeezed out of that data, right? That lemon's been, been squeezed pretty dry. And so you know, a lot of the forensic accounting, a lot of uh, you know, analyzing uh, all sorts of ratios, don't do anything uh, for investors in the, in the US anymore. And, and almost we, we almost don't teach them anymore in our accounting or our investment class because they just don't work, right? Not because they don't make sense, but because everyone who thought they made sense used it to trade and so, so no more alpha. But in China, these things work really, really well because uh, the average investor is a retail person who doesn't really use a computer and doesn't understand accounting. So uh, as a quant, um, having that data and acting on data is, is very powerful and very profitable. Yeah, you know, um, I, was, I was smiling as you're saying that because I mean, it, it's not even a, a recent thing in the US. I mean, even a decade plus years ago, you pull up like a traditional factor, multi-factor based stock that screens well. And then you look at the holders and it's like 12 different quant funds. You know, it's everyone. Yeah. It's, you know, and you know all the names, D.E. Shaw, on and on and on, all the way down. Um, and so when you think about the edge, like you said, is like everyone has the same PhDs and the same um, databases. And so the, it reminds me of the old Munger you know, talking about where to go fishing, you know, and, and, and the U.S. is a place where there's lots of fishermen uh, and, and many other places around the world. Uh, there's a lot less competition and it's but it's also in many ways harder too. like you got to uh, make the effort and clean the data that that you're not just presented with a, a clean, clear, crisp data set from from fact set. Um, there's a laundry list of sort of consistent concerns that people have when it comes to especially emerging markets foreign markets in general from the u.s and we hear the same ones over and over again uh i understand u.s stocks currencies headache but there's even some that are specific to china maybe walk through a couple of the ones you hear the most of i imagine questions about state owned enterprises have to be in the top three right so let's let's hear you either agree with or dispel some of the biggest uh, reasons not to invest in China and how to how to think about those. Yep, state owned enterprises. Um, you know, it's not just China; it's, it's a lot of EM, which are dominated by state owned enterprises. Uh, and I think a lot of people take a blunt instrument to to that uh, concern and just say, "Hey, that just X out all the state owned enterprises." Now, in China, if you exit all the state-owned enterprises, uh, uh, you are not going to have a lot left over, certainly at least not in the large cap spectrum, right? And, and basically, all essentially, all the Hong Kong listed stocks, which are, I think, uh, in the bulk of what's in MSCI EM, right? Like, you would have, like, no China left over in your MSCI EM if you want to take out the state-owned enterprise. So you want to look at more carefully, right? You know, you really do want to think about, well, are state-owned enterprises bad, right? The theory seems to suggest, okay, well, if someone's running the company, uh, with a secondary or maybe even a primary concern that's not related to profit maximization. That can't be good news. That's just poor governance. So we, we looked at the different state on prices and see, well, you know, does, what does the data tell us? And what we found was um, you kind of have two extremes, right? On the one extreme, you have these regional uh, affiliated control state on prices, basically where the chairman, the CEO are sort of a local political boss. 
and our sus suspicions are right, right? They care a lot about local employment, local GDP. Uh, they're often the biggest employers, uh, biggest taxpayers in the region. Uh, and there's almost like no separation between the, the government and the state owned enterprise. And there's just a lot of sort of messiness and some maybe political graft uh, that, uh, that the firm gets involved and become a conduit uh, for, for sort of shady dealings. Uh, so they are the performance of those regional state owned prices. Uh, they are, you know, five, six percent behind the rest of the market. But when you look at the centrally connected state owned enterprise, uh, meaning the chairman, the CEO came direct from Beijing. Uh, the performance is usually two, three percent better than the rest of the market. And when you think about it, well, that sort of makes sense, right? It's like, you know, Beijing's finally, you know, fed up with a particular scale enterprise, sends in the A team, right? Like these are the people who are coming in to make things happen, right? To get rid of whatever is, is not working. Uh, and everyone pays attention, right? You know, everyone's working super hard. It's national attention being put on this company. Uh, so you actually do see very, very strong performance, very strong recovery. And oftentimes uh, it's also a signal that some kind of major policy tailwind is gonna come the way of this company. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you look more carefully, uh, there are state-owned enterprises and there are state-owned enterprises. So, so that's, that's kind of useful to know. And so you, you don't really wanna throw out, you know, baby with bathwater in this case. Yeah, I, I actually think the same way on that. Um, how do you guys put together the portfolio in the ETF? Uh, number of names, sector composition. I looked at it and seem you had a decent financials exposure, a decent tech exposure. Uh, how often is it rebalancing? What's the uh, what's the approach? Well, you know, we start with a very large universe. As I mentioned, you know, there are thirty eight hundred liquidly traded names, but you know, we don't we don't start that aggressive. We start with kind of the eight hundred that are you know really good liquidity. Uh, large enough capitalization, uh, you're not likely to move markets with these stocks. And then from there, we start to pare it down, down to ultimately about 100 stocks that we like the most. And they're going to be broadly diversified across different industries. Uh, and obviously within uh, industries is where we, we really pick uh, firms that we truly think are high quality, great management, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, safe from a capital structure, from a, a volatility perspective, and, and their they're value fairly have good growth potential. Now, of course, all of that done quantitatively rather than, than uh, qual uh, quantitatively rather than uh, qualitatively. But, uh, you know, we're a big believer that, you know, the qualitative approach uh, can, can work very well. It's just a matter of applying data and make it work, work even better in a quant approach. That's how we construct the portfolio. And now we obviously bring into the construction process, uh, you know, the latest technology, the, the latest sort of empirical methodologies available. So a lot of um, big data type uh, uh, econometrics, uh, machine learning, robust optimization, very, very aggressive, I would say, uh, uh, sort of downweighting to fight against uh, in sample, data mining, uh, that sort of thing. So, so you, you know, what you would expect a very, very good academic quant to do, you know, we do all of that. Uh, and, and these, these quantitative techniques work extremely well in China. And the reason it works extremely well in China is because it's just a more inefficient market where those techniques haven't been applied and haven't been employed. Uh, and, and so we're, being able to take advantage of going into essentially a green field market where quant approach is 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 new and therefore it's not crowded there. And, and so on that sort of you you referenced this in the beginning and coming back full circle to kind of the the growth value and as we look at sort of a top down macro lens at what's going on in China like where does it stand is the market in general is it cheap is it expensive are there pockets that are bubbly or not? Um, are there areas that are like um, generational opportunities? How are you seeing the, the, the lay of the land uh, in general? And feel free to, if you want to talk about any specific names, you're more than yeah. welcome to as well. Yeah, so uh, the median stock in China is not expensive. Uh, certainly, if you look at the you know, price to trailing earnings uh, or price to you know, smooth pass, you know, five years of earnings, uh, you know, China is kind of median when it comes to valuation multiple versus U.S. Uh, U.S. is about, you know, two, maybe even three standard deviations away in terms of um, 
you know, relatively more expensive. Uh, so China is certainly not expensive, but you're right that the cross section, right? The dispersion is enormous, right? The banks in China are as cheap as anything can be. And then the technology firms are even more expensive than the technology firms we see uh, in the US, right? Take, for example, uh, in the US, we have Tesla, which has gone up 6X uh, in the last 12 months. There is a China Tesla, uh, NIO. Now that firm happens to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, it's because it couldn't qualify for listing in China, right? It's just a mm. company that's near bankrupt and makes no money. You know, it loses $44 a share, right? For every car it sells, it loses like 100,000, right? This is China's answer to Tesla. NIO has gone up 60 times in the last 12 months, right? Yeah. It's gone from a penny stock near bankrupt to a, you know, $60 billion market cap company near bankruptcy. <laughs> and then that's just uh, how stretched valuation multiple can be in a cross section. And, uh, and so when we're looking at it clearly, you know, that's not the kind of bubble we want to participate in, right? Because uh, you get into that, it could run, you know, it could run from 60 billion to, to become 120 billion in market cap, um, but it could also go the other direction. And then if it goes the other direction, you probably can't come back from that one. Uh, so things that are probably more sensible if you want to participate in, in China growth in a, in a you know, more quality oriented way, uh, look at banks, right? And now most people are going to be shocked by that recommendation because people think of Chinese banks are horrible, right? So many, you know, you know so, so much bad debt on their books. Uh, so maybe even a lot of hidden bad debt that, that hasn't even been recognized. And again, that is a bit of a, I would say a misconception of how banks actually uh, operate in, in China, right? We think of, oh, all the banks are state-owned enterprises and they must make lots of bad loans to other state-owned enterprises that they'll never see that money back. Uh, when in fact, I'll tell you an anecdote. Uh, start of last year, right, just around COVID time, uh, one top bank executive in China was, uh, was you know, arrested and, and indicted. And you kind of go, well, you know, must be for, for fraud, right? Making a huge loan to his cousin. No, not at all. He was indicted because he didn't make enough loans. Uh, mm. He was not supporting the real economy when the real economy was suffering, right? He's being an evil Wall Street banker, you know, not making enough loans. And so after that, all the banks got the message and said, well, we, we, we got to look like, you know, sympathetic good bankers. Uh, so what they did, they didn't go out and make lots of bad loans. Maybe a few regional ones did. All the banks simply reclassified their perfectly good loans as bad loans and start taking massive hits against their own earnings and tell the regulator, doing what we can, look at our books, you know, don't, don't harass us anymore. And as a result, you look at, say, China Merchant, right? One of the best run banks in China. And you'll realize they got a lot of loans that's classified as bad loans that are paying interest, right? Like that, that's not how you classify a bad loan, right? And they're building up a massive reserve for bad loans that aren't even bad. Uh, and so all they're doing is, again, complying with perhaps, you know, a little too paternalistic, interventionist policymakers while being very good steward of, of the business. Uh, and, and so if you can, you know, look past the, the numbers and understanding the true story and understanding what's really happening and why, uh, in this case, you'll find that many banks are sort of phenomenal uh, quality value plays. Most of the conversations you're having with, advisors, investors in the U.S. I imagine uh, the, the foreign story in general is similar to the ones I have, which is story as old as time, which is people traditionally are pretty under allocated outside the U.S. with the, the whole home country bias, which you see everywhere. Um, I imagine that's particularly prominent towards China. And you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong there or not. Um, how are advisors thinking about their allocations and maybe comment on where we stand to in the whole benchmark inclusion story. Is that a story that's over, that's still going on? Uh, what's happening? Yeah, so when we talk to advisors, uh, you know, often we find advisors who would, who would say, well, you know, I already have EM in my EM, I have China. And in fact, I don't even like my EM, right? I'm going to cut my EM and double down on the US, right? And you, you just hear a lot of advisors who say that. It's like EM's been a bad diversifier. And by that, they mean, well, EM's underperformed, right? And of course, when you diversify, right, there's always going to be one thing that is better than the other, right? That's the point of diversification. But most advisors who, who 
have been, you know, experiencing EM underperformance um, feels like that's been a bad diversifier. Uh, so we hear a lot of that. Uh, and, and the data actually um, uh, is it, kind of surprising. Um, if you take China out of EM, uh, the corporate earnings growth, right? EPS growth for EMX China has been 2.5% nominal, right? If you take out inflation in EM, it's actually negative, right? So uh, yeah, EM corporations have actually done very, very poorly uh, when you exile China and there may be structural reasons why, why EM could structurally underperform. Uh, so EM has only done okay-ish because China is in it, right? If you look at China independently, last 15 years, China's grown at 14% uh, uh, year over year on uh, earnings growth, which is actually um, three times as high as US corporations. For the last 15 years, US corporations only grew at a shade over 5% uh, year over year nominally. So, you know, first thing is to just tell people, look, if you don't like EM, you know, China is not what's driving that problem, right? China is actually unique in, in it's like the savior for, for the EM portfolio. Uh, and then, of course, the next question is, well, okay, I got EM and 40% of my EM is already China. Like, would I really want to do more China? Uh, if you look at your uh, MSCI EM, uh, within it, most of the China exposure is actually the Hong Kong shares, the H, and the ADRs. And so if you look at those firms um, versus the A, which has got a tiny, tiny bit only in, in the MSCI index, the offshore actually grew at about half uh, the speed, right? So the earnings growth is only half the uh, earnings growth of the China A. So the MSCI sort of included the wrong part of China. So it's a lot of state owner price. It's a lot of you know, firms that have low quality that list in the US uh, who have poor growth. So it's, it's, uh, if you look at your EM exposure, the China in there uh, isn't what you want, right? They're not uh, the one that's given you uh, high growth. And also they're not the ones that are onshore, which have a lot more alpha potential. Uh, so, so that's you know, what, what, what I sort of highlight to advisors uh, when they think about you know, EM, China and EM, do they really want more, uh, more China? Now, of course, uh, this will change gradually as more of the interesting China, which is the China A exposure are included more into the MSCI uh, indices. So, so Mev, as you mentioned, uh, MSCI has promised to add more of the proper onshore China over time because access is easier and they do realize that there's great transparency data available uh, for the onshore Asia. So there's really no reason to exclude them. Uh, today, you know, China A is 0.4% uh, of the ACQUI index, barely 4% of the uh, MSCI EM index. Uh, and, and those are all likely to you know, increase by 5x over time. So we can expect a lot more passive flows or benchmark aware flows to go into China A uh, over the next few years. And again, for advisors, some of them, you know, that does give them comfort to know that they're, you know, they're not going to be alone uh, going into China A. That is going to be a huge part of the index. And there's going to be a lot of flow coming after them if they move earlier today. And I think that's been a, a, a positive, uh, reassuring, uh, I guess, uh, uh, sort of change on the horizon for a lot of the advisors. And of course, uh, obviously uh, we are uh, under a new administration. So uh, the US-China tension uh, is likely to at least be different, right? It'll be reduced and it'll be different. And I think that's given some advisors greater comfort that uh, you know, the uh, headline risk, let's call it, uh, or the dis broader discomfort driven by the U.S.-China tension uh, would spill over to sort of a negative client reaction. So, so these are yeah. the things that we heard from advisors. Yeah, you know, I mean, talking to investors in emerging markets in general, but really foreign, you know, so much of the dialogue and narrative gets caught up in with what's going on with the government, what's going on with public policy, which often can be totally distanced from what's going on with the companies. And then even the companies can go on <laughs> to get distance from what's going on with the stocks too. Um, presumably, uh, you said you had a number of funds that have been managing um, in China. Uh, you guys got planning on launching uh, some new funds as well. Is this going to be a one trick pony? You're going to do a whole a whole lineup of, uh, of funds? Absolutely a whole lineup. Uh, we're going to... Uh 
you know, bring over from, from Asia, uh, you know, many of our strategies that are appropriate for US investors. Uh, so we brought over the first one, you know, think of the first one as the flagship core offering, right? If you mm. want to have one strategy to kind of cover your China gap in your portfolio, this uh, large cap, high quality portfolio, I think is the one that is is right, right? It's 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 safe. It's going to let you participate in the growth. It's in all the interesting, the right names that are going to experience growth over the next 10, 20 years. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, where there's just a lot more alpha uh, and where there are a lot more interesting price dynamics are going to be in the small caps. Uh, so, you know, we have a very successful small cap growth product in China that, that I think was the best performing, you know, China um, ETF uh, in the world last year in terms of return. It produced like you know, something like 98.5% return. Uh, so we're, we're going to bring that over for people who really want like a very concentrated dosage of the small and the growth factor in their portfolio. Uh, so yes, a whole lineup. Uh, obviously, we want to bring bring over fixed income capabilities, where look for taking on China's sovereign credit, uh, you you can earn three percent additional yield. Right? If you think about it, you know, China probably has a better sovereign credit than the U.S. in the sense that they're printing less money than we are, <laughs> and also you know U.S. owes China four trillion dollars. So you know it's it's unlikely that China will default on anyone before the U.S. defaults on China. Uh, so that's certainly I think interesting for for advisors who are looking for a fixed income alternative that isn't yielding zero. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see on that. Um, you know, I, I think the, the equity side is, despite what we've talked about on some of the commonly held um, misconceptions as well as hangups people have, uh, fixed income, um, you know, particularly with foreign bonds, I think a lot of people get stuck in their head when they think of foreign uh, bonds, they think of negative yielding. They just assume like, well, you know, I can get one, two percent here. Elsewhere sounds even worse, um, <laughs> but that's not always the case, right? Plenty of plenty of markets are higher yielding um, than a, and and a varying credit credit quality versus the U.S. But I see probably is relative to the global market portfolio benchmark. That's got to be the biggest underweight in my mind is U.S. investors and in, investing in any foreign bonds at all. Most most investors I talk to don't invest in, in any uh, foreign bond markets, sovereign or credit. Yeah, I, I think there is a probably a psychological bias. We think of, well, the bond portfolio is a safety portfolio. Uh, so even if it doesn't provide much yield, it provides safety, right? In extreme events, flight to quality, it's going to go to dollars, it's, it's going to go to US Treasury. And, and that's true in the short run. And obviously when extreme events happen, that, that's certainly been true. But I think the joke that calls you know, US bonds as a, uh, not risk-free return, but return-free risk, that's increasingly not a joke, right? That's increasing the reality, right? If you hold something that's yielding less than inflation, right? You're getting a lot of risk, you know, more inflation, you know, the, the more you lose. Or if the government wants to stop inflation and raise rate, you lose even more. So there's like no, there's not a winning outcome there in the long run. So I think, I think it is a, it is a under-examined area in, in most client portfolios. Like why, why do you have uh, in your 60, 40, split 40% in mostly sort of U.S. Uh, high quality government debt, right? That, that really doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a conversation we, we often talk about. We say the world's largest asset class, foreign ex-U.S. bonds and, and, Almost no one we talk to is ever allocated. Um, I think a lot of it gets caught up in uh, fears of of currency moves. How do, how do you guys think about currencies in general? Are I assume the, the funds are unhedged, or do you hedge some of them, or do you have variants that you consider? How do you guys think about it? Uh, we're definitely unhedged. Uh, you know, part of it is you know hedging from renminbi over to the dollar. Right off the bat, you lose three percent, right? And and there's just no reason to give up three percent in this environment when it's so hard to to earn uh, yield. Uh, and if you look at emerging Asian currencies, uh, as that economy is emerging, right, as its per capita GDP is catching up with the rest of the world, what you see has always been strengthening currency. So we kind of got data and history on our side why being unhedged on your renminbi is, is a smart move. And you add on top of that, really the ambition of China to rise up as a you know, 
global superpower, uh, if, if not a, you know, a, a number, you know, a solid number two, uh, you know, they certainly uh, would, 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 you know, uh, aspire to, to be maybe uh, even on par with, uh, with the U.S. So, you know, that kind of ambition often uh, means, you know, they're, they're going to get the renminbi into a settlement currency. It's already part of the, uh, the, the, the SDR uh, for IMF. Uh, so that currency could actually uh, at some point reach almost U.S. dollar-like status. And that's going to, you know, mean a lot more appreciation uh, for the currency. So, so not guarantee, but certainly with that political aspiration and that economic aspiration, the, the likelihood is a, a strengthening currency versus a weakening currency. When, uh, what's the time frame for these new funds coming out? It would be this year, next year, some, both? Well, we're certainly hoping to bring something out uh, probably every six months. And it gives us a chance to get the existing ETF to a certain size and on the platform uh, before we will work on the next one. Uh, but we certainly like to get them out to, to, to investors as soon as we can. Excellent. We're looking forward to all those. Um, you know, as we kind of uh, wrap a bow on the China discussion, what anything else we didn't cover that you think is either underappreciated, overappreciated? Have any insights on where Jack Ma has been all this time? Anything else in the, of the China story as we look out to the horizon that you think people aren't talking about they should? Just anything else on your brain about China? Well, I think it's definitely fun to talk about Jack Ma, right? Because that's probably the one thing uh, all the conspiracy theorists uh, really want to, to kind of hone in on. Uh, you know, it's easy to spin that into, look, you know, there is just, you know, uh, no property right. If you're too successful, you're too wealthy, the government goes after you. Uh, and this is what happened to the, you know, and financial IPO. And, and that's a spectacular story, catches eyeballs, but it's just not true. If you look at the uh, government allegation of why the IPO can't move forward, it's because the government realized that Ant Financial, uh, as a technology company, uh, trying to disrupt, you know, they, they certainly would like to encourage that uh, for innovation's sake. But what they also realize is Ant Financial is getting into insurance, uh, micro lending, you know, credit cards, bank lending, uh, taking in deposits, selling mutual funds, right? It was in every single regulated business there is in China. And these will be regulated business everywhere else in the world. And they have, I think, one one thousandth of the required capital for all the regular activities they're undertaking. And they knew if the regulators take a closer look that uh, Ant Financial actually uh, would, would, would fail as a company and then to protect investors from you know, brushing into that hot IPO, um, they had to call it off and really kind of look at all the businesses that Ant Financial has gotten into that they really don't have the license to and nor the uh, capital adequacy uh, to support. Uh, of course, subsequently, Jack Ma was placed under house arrest. And, you know, this isn't where they, they go waterboard him and, you know, make him confess to crimes he, has, crimes he has not committed. Now, this is where they, they basically say, look, you know, Ant Financial or Alibaba is not the only giant tech companies in China that have gone into banking, um, you know, wealth management. Uh, many other tech companies have. And they simply need to understand, well, what is the business model? Uh, what is the risk? How do you regulate? Because uh, you as an insider um, can best help us draft regulation and, uh, and make this right. Uh, so it's really not as exciting as, as people you know, thought uh, was, right? Sure, you know, Jack Ma is an outspoken person and he, he tends to want to be the smartest person in China. And, and that, that job, unfortunately, is not available. Uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's that, but that's not the primary reason for why the, uh, the Ant Financial IPO was stopped. Yeah. yeah. And then I would also add, you know, the one thing that I think is on people's mind is we look at the U.S. China dynamic and we tend to want to think that, you know, Cold War is coming. We tend to want to map that to uh, what we recollected as the, uh, the U.S. Russia Cold War. Right. You know, and then that's because China's a communist country and and that sort of maps well over to to you know uh soviet union of the yesteryear but that's probably not the right mental imagery the the right one is likely 
the U.S. Japan relationship when Japan was rising as the head of the Asian, you know, tigers, right? Uh, that's what China is doing today, right? Its per capita GDP is rising rapidly. It's gone from very low value ad manufacturing to very high value ad manufacturing. In fact, having its own brand, it's becoming wealthy and one of the larger uh, consumer marketplace where it's important for U.S. manufacturers and U.S. brands. So the relationship between U.S. and China is much more like U.S. and Japan. And so it's not one that's likely to be you know, determined and dominated by political and geopolitical considerations, but more, you know, just trade, uh, trades and tariffs. Uh, so if you look at it that way, it's less scary. And it's a kind of co-opetition that we've seen before, right? You know, competing because both want to sell and want both, both you know, markets uh, uh, want, to, want to compete and, and win in terms of uh, trade. Um, but they also lean on each other because you, you have to have another side to trade, right? You can't, you can't just trade with yourself. And so that kind of co-opetition, I think, is long-term healthy for both sides. You know, both markets, you know, and market participants are just going to create more wealth and more prosperity uh, as long as uh, things don't 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 sour and we go into a you know pissing match uh, in a, in a trade war. Uh, and so I hope investors um, see it and understand it that way, uh, because that would certainly uh, make investing in China less scary. And also, I think because of this co-opetition, the negative correlation uh, between the two markets are likely uh, to persist, right? Because in the short run, as they compete, it's a little bit of zero sum. In the long run, the pie is just getting bigger. So you actually have two markets, uh, both growing, you know, but sort of different uh, regulatory environments, uh, but yet both growing. And uh, while they short-term compete, they're long-term uh, collaborating and building a better pie, bigger pie. And then I think if you have you know, both in your portfolio, uh, you're you're gonna you're gonna win on the return side and you're gonna win on the risk reduction side. Right? You don't have to bet on a winner, right? You don't have to bet. Oh, is China going to be the winner or is the U.S. going to be the winner? I think they'll both be winners. Yeah, It'd be fun to watch. Certainly, um, as someone who's been, uh, you know, had a, a number of different roles as uh, an analyst, portfolio manager, founder, professor. Uh, there's been, you know, last few years have been um, entertaining as always, a little crazy with markets. We had pandemic, we had GameStop, we had uh, crazy outperformance spreads on value and other things. Any other gen general thoughts on markets in the, the first quarter of 2021 uh, or things that got you scratching your head or excited about? Well, the thing that's really got me scratching my head is I've always expected China to gradually, you know, converge toward the U.S., right? The markets will be more institutional, more rational. Uh, but uh, the convergence seems to temporarily be going the other direction, right? I mean, U.S. has gone from 3% retail trading to, I think, almost 30% retail trading. And, and you have, you know, what dominates financial news, really GameStop and the main stock, stocks, right? And, and that's been the surprising thing. And as a researcher, it, it's kind of fun to watch, right? You know, efficient markets kind of boring to study. It's, it's much more mm -hmm. exciting today to see what's mm -hmm. going on. Yeah, the uh, you know, it's funny. There's there's a handful of rhymes uh, with various periods. As a, as a student of history, it's always you know seductive to look back at the times and say, well, this is looks just like this, whatever it may be. And more often than not, there's there's parts of it. Uh, certainly that look familiar uh, over various periods. You know, you can certainly see some late 90s similarities and some of the stuff going on, the retail interest, some of the high flying names, um, but but other things look, look different as well, you know? So um, are you still teaching anymore or is that on, on hold since uh, pandemic and why you've been uh, running around the world starting a company? Well, uh, it's it's been been hard to teach in person, and I I try to teach one class online. Uh, my God, you know, it's like three hours of talking to yourself. Yeah. It's 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 not a good experience. I'm sure it's not a good experience for students. It's it's certainly not a good experience for the teacher. Right? You don't get any feedback on. It's like going well. Are people getting it? You don't see any bodies 
language and of course you got 60 students right so you can't have everyone's camera be on and then literally it's like just you talking to an ipad uh, mm -hmm. so i i hope we can go back to to you know, an actual classroom very soon data will have holograms here soon i think that's i can't be too far away right uh where vr vr classrooms um who knows uh, Jason, people want to find out more about Rayland, the new ETF, R-A-Y-C is the ticker. Uh, where do they go? Well, come to our website. Uh, so come to www.raylian.com and there'll be you know, all sorts of links that take you to the landing page for the fund that gives you more information about our research, more information about the company, the, the people, and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, yeah, hopefully you also follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, I don't know what Twitter and LinkedIn actually, you know, does for business. But uh, I, I'm starting to be addicted to uh, seeing people like my articles. So I, 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 I know it makes no sense, but it, it's, it's very addicting to see people like. Well, you got articles. a lot of great ones and we'll link to them in the show notes and certainly any uh, that you put out in the future, uh, keep us on the distribution list. And when you do a, a Chinese investor tour, let me know. Uh, I'll come join. Having, having never been, it'd be fun to uh, Oh, come with me. And, yeah. In, in China, yeah. it's GameStop every day, I tell you. <laughs> Oh man, I, that's that's worn me out this year already. We're only two months into 2021, and I thought it was gonna be nice, peaceful post 2020. And I think things are just getting crazier by the day. So, who knows? Um, Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Matt.